Thanks for joining me for uh, just a short time together for this evening devotional on Sunday night. I uh, hope that you're doing well. It's been a beautiful day today, and we got to worship together this morning. I hope you were able to join us either in person or online. And uh, I've noticed that our numbers have been creeping up. More and more people feel, feeling comfortable coming back to the assembly, and I'm excited about that. It's been good to see some folks um, that haven't seen in a while. And uh, so some of you are in the building this morning, and I'm excited about that. I think we all are, as things seem to be, I don't know, feeling a little bit more normal, I guess. Uh, I know we're not past this uh, current situation we're facing, and there uh, there are still people hurting out there, uh, but I'm thankful for progress that's been made, and it seems as if we've maybe turned a corner. I, I certainly hope so, but um, appreciate every one of you and hope that you're doing uh, very well. I. You know, I talked to our congregation this morning about 1 Peter 2, um, verse 18, starting verse 18, going through verse 25. And um, uh, Peter, you know, this this letter that we've been looking at is is uh, so applicable, I think. Um, and I mentioned a couple of those things this morning. But I want to give you a couple of things to think about as you go into your work week, school week, you know, whatever it's going to be happening in your life this week, just to think about this. Um, something I hadn't noticed really before, I guess, in my studies that God brought out for me this week in this study is the connection between persecution and following the example of Jesus and responding to it and how that makes a difference in the world itself. Now, we've all thought, I'm sure we thought about Jesus being willing to sacrifice himself for us, of course, and we thought about that principle that ought to apply in our lives. But connecting that with our influence on the world, I think is a, it's something a little bit new to me, at least to see it this clearly from a couple of different passages. I mentioned to you the quotation from Tertullian about the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what he meant by that early on in the first few centuries of Christianity's existence was that they persecuted, they killed Christians, and yet they couldn't stop the movement. You know, They couldn't stop the body of Christ from growing because people are drawn to something like that, where people believe something so deeply they're willing to die for it. There's another text I ran across this week that I want to share with you. It's pretty familiar to you, I think. Uh, Matthew 5, right near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is going through what we call the Beatitudes, you know, the eighth one, and verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for uh, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's an eighth beatitude, you know, pretty familiar to us. The next part, which I think I typically have separated it, the very next verse says, you are the salt of the earth. And then the next verse after that says, you are the light of the world. So it's just interesting. He goes through the beatitudes. He comes to the last one. He says, Blessed are you when you're persecuted for, blessed are those who are persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That ties it back to the very first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking about what it means to be in the kingdom, right? So the eighth one, if you're persecuted as the prophets were, then you're part of the kingdom of heaven. The very next thing he says is, you will be the salt of the earth, you will be the light of the world. And that's not a coincidence that Jesus situates them right next to each other. That your persecution, your, your being persecuted by the world and responding appropriately to that can cause you to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Not a single one of us wants to be persecuted, I don't think. We don't have the martyr complex, you know, where we want to suffer, we want to die. But at the same time, I just want us to think, because it's such a, an important biblical emphasis that sort of is a thread that runs through the New Testament and on into the first few centuries, especially of the church's existence, is that suffering, when people oppose us for our faith, that gives us a unique opportunity to make a difference in people's lives, to, to make an impression on the world. And, and you remember in uh, 1 Peter 2, I pointed this out this morning, that this, this section, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. And then he goes into the section where you're going to be treated unjustly. And so he's saying, 
be careful how you act in the world because you have an opportunity when they see how you respond, they might glorify God. They see your good deeds, they will glorify God on that final day, right? That's what he said just, and then he says, submit to every human institution, submit to to masters, to, to, to people who are above you in some sort of power structure, um, especially when they're, when they treat you unjustly, it gives you an opportunity for your faith to, to shine. Now we don't do things. I, I always feel the need to offer this caveat. We don't do things as Christians to like, look at me, you know, look at how, look at how much I suffer. Just the woe is me. Uh, you know, I have it terrible. That's sort of look at the world. It treats me horribly. It's not that it's a silent kind of response. It's a, it's a humble, not me centered, uh, but it's a humble confidence that's grounded in the hope that we have, that because Jesus suffered and died and ultimately was exalted, that that pattern is is one that not only that Jesus followed, but that it, it passes on to his followers, that we too will suffer at times. But when we're faithful in the suffering, then on the other side of the cross, so to speak, on the other side of the suffering, there's a resurrection and there's exaltation, that pattern will be repeated in us. We suffer because of the sins of others in order, hopefully, to bring about their salvation through Jesus. So here's a practical thing. I'll be done. Um, when you uh, when you go to school or work or wherever and you are mistreated, let that mistreatment never be because you do wrong. That's what Peter says. That Don't do evil. You know, there's no doesn't do any good if you're, you, suffer, you suffer because you're evil. But you will be mistreated at times. When you are, just think about this. What kind of opportunity have you just been given to look like Jesus, who, when he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When they struck him on one cheek, he didn't strike them back. When they punished him, he did not respond in kind, but rather he simply suffered as our lamb, providing us an example that we should also suffer, that we should, you know, suffer like him. One thing I didn't point out this morning is this uh, really cool little phrase he uses, Peter uses here, is that we might follow in his steps. And that that uh, that, that language here, he left us an example. That, that word example there is a word that's like those letters at the top of a page when you're a little kid and you're learning how to write your letters, you know, they're, they're dotted and you, you trace them over, you know, A, B, and C. Then you go down the page, right? And you, you try to do it. So that model line at the top of the page, that's how this actual word was used. It was a like an example that, that kids would follow. And so I think one book I was reading this week suggested that maybe for us as Christians, it's, it's kind of like, just visualize as you deal with suffering, you've got Jesus kind of hovering over you, leaning over your shoulder. He's guiding your hands. He's guiding your feet. He's guiding your, 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 your speech. He is the one. We do it because we're mindful of God. That's what Peter said. And he's the one who is our example. We follow in his steps. Great thing. We get to, we get to be like Jesus. And so none of us want to suffer, but when we do, we have this beautiful opportunity to show the world a different way. And instead of responding to violence with violence, to persecution with anger, we, um, we go in the pathway of Jesus. It's a great thing. We're gonna play some songs. I hope we'll be able to sing along with them and uh, worship together. And uh, appreciate so much you, you joining us. I wanna close my time with you with a short prayer, okay? Lord, thank you so much for a beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for giving us opportunities to make a difference in the world. Uh, thank you for giving us your spirit who empowers us to live for you. And we pray that when we have situations in life where people hurt us or persecute us because of our faith, that we will have the courage because of you because of Jesus to respond as Jesus did to not respond to violence with violence not to respond to anger with anger 
but that we'll have that quiet, that quiet, humble confidence that Jesus had, knowing that he is waiting for us on the other side of the suffering. And if it comes to us, we love you, Lord. We thank you. Please help us this week to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.